Hello everyone and welcome to the Planning Game Podcast, your weekly podcast for real world planning solutions to real world planning problems. My name is John McDermott from Town Planning Expert. Let's get right into it. another episode of the planning game and i'm joined by joanna and joanna you'll have to forgive me i will butcher your surname if i even try and pronounce it so it's pronounced as that's all right poharski yeah i would have butchered that (laughs) um joanna is one of my uh, good friends and mentees on the white box property developer secrets program uh and yeah joanna welcome to the planning game Thank you very much, John. Lovely to be here. Um, so, Joanna, as you know, I'm, I'm very big on people sort of telling their story and being given the opportunity to tell the wider world about themselves. It's a really important thing to do. So, um, for the benefit of the listeners at home and those who are repeating this on Dave, um, tell us about Joanna. Brilliant. Um, So um, I have had quite a corporate um, upbringing, if you like, and um, it was not until maybe three years ago um, when I started looking at my longer term future, specifically my pension, when I started realizing that maybe the corporate career is not going to secure my future as well as uh, as I had hoped for. Mm. And um, in addition to that, um, I have also have seen throughout my life challenges people have seen around housing, uh, both in terms of um, even finding a suitable property, but also then around property security. Um, So um, since I have been able to, I've always tried to have um, and own my own property. So nobody could uh, just uh, decide that uh, I was not able to live there any longer. Right, so doing it all the old fashioned way. Yes, yes. Um, uh, yes, I think I think I'm probably the prototype of doing it the old fashioned way. Um, and um, then, however, the, the big moment came when I started to come across um, literature from people like Robert Kiyosaki, a very mm. different way of thinking, uh, came across uh, Tony Robbins, um, yeah. and really people who try to um, take people along on a journey of thinking in a different way, which mm. sadly is, is very often criticized and really uh, put down by the more traditional establishment of which, you know, uh, I've been part. So uh, I understand both sides, I have to say. Mm-hmm. Um, when I started looking into um, securing my financial future, I did uh, a few things. So first of all, I looked for experts who, who understands how to build that future. And um, I came across wealth builders. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, familiar with them. And that's, yeah, uh, and uh, Kevin and the organization has been very helpful, looking, showing me different options of how to build that future. Um, I've always had a passion for property. So uh, my parents keep telling me how at the age of two, um, just walking, just talking, I've been already trying to help them build a, a summer house. Uh, right. Apparently there are tools still related to the time, so I'm still waiting to see them. <laughs> but uh, there, there is a family story history of that. Um, and um, in, in the UK, uh, it's a very different property market compared to Austria or Poland, where, where I, have, uh, I have lived uh, much of my life. And um, one of the things that has become quite apparent to me is that um, you don't have to be a big company. You don't have to be a Barrett, for example, to be able to help. So as a small um, company, medium-sized company, actually in the UK, you do have the opportunities to make a difference and work with councils, work with other like-minded individuals 
to really uh, build housing, um, both private and, um, and, and social, and support people who are looking for housing um, and, and giving them the opportunity to, to live in, in a safe environment and an environment where they don't have to worry to be, to be put in the street at a random time. Yeah, yeah, and especially now. Especially now, especially now with what's going on and of course this is being recorded as part of the covid chronicles i'm calling them the the, the period of time um where we were locked down as a country where we we stopped being a free society and started to become a more uh controlled society mm -hmm. as it were um so which country did you come from originally so, so, you in Poland, so. so I, I grew up in Poland as a child. We then emigrated to Austria when I was 11. Mm -hmm. And I've been in the UK since, well, for, for good, since 2002. Wonderful. Wonderful. And, and so you said that the markets are very different. So what, mm -hmm. what differences have you sort of recognised, noticed in, in, in between sort of Austria, Poland, and how like they do property and... And, and Britain in the way it does property. Mm. So I think, first of all, there's a huge difference of mindset. So in the UK, the right to buy, um, which I think has been introduced uh, by Thatcher, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, has really completely shifted um, the, the whole uh, landscape and the mindset as well uh, of what people aim for, what, what people's ambition is in terms of owning property. Um, and I think it is the financial institutions that then followed suit and tried to enable that, that ownership. Um, mm. So when you look at Austria, for example, um, normally you have to have a much bigger deposit to be able to buy. There are more stringent requirements. Uh, very often the commissions uh, are very much higher as well. And uh, at the same time, renting is actually um, very safe. Yeah. And many people rent for life, so they don't have to worry, they are protected. Uh, so the incentives to buy are, are much, uh, much lower. Mm. And the opportunities to buy, are, are, um, it's much more challenging to buy um, for an individual. Wow, that's, that, that's surprising, to be fair. Mm. Um, because, yes. you know, we, 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 we're sold the European dream as this liberalist uh, ideologue. Uh, that lives just off our shores and then you go to a place like Austria and it's actually more difficult to buy a property than it is in the UK. Yes, so the threshold is higher at the same time also um, you, you could see you could say in, in, a, in a different way the, we look at the quality of properties and uh, this is something that I find always quite challenging and and you work with listed properties so I mm -hmm. hope you take it the right way but um, uh, I live in a property that's in a conservation area and I have uh, lived in a number of those and I'm always surprised that the conservation area is being taken as a reason to not upgrade, for example, windows, mm. uh, where there's such a push really to, to protect the environment, really save energy. And then, you know, um, it's not possible to replace um, something in a very straightforward way. And the like for like is sometimes um, actually making it impossible uh, from a cost perspective and practicalities to actually replace windows. So that, that's just as an example where, where I think actually there's something that's meant and to be really, something really positive, preserving the character, actually is not really working from a sustainability point of view. Yeah, it's part of our system in the UK, which is getting slowly not fit for purpose. So the whole point behind conservation areas was to designate areas that were visually special, that, mm -hmm. that had a special character or appearance that were unique, mm -hmm. but couldn't be listed. So they, they were, you know, it was a, a much wider area. It was designed to give that intervening level of control. But the level of control has been pushed now to such a point that you're right. The, 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 the requirement to preserve or enhance has overridden the requirement to uh, upgrade, improve, and the enhanced test is forgotten mm. for the preserve test. Yeah, uh, so that's where the, you know you end up with that competing 
argument of, well, I want to improve the sustainability of my property. I want to make sure that it's here in another hundred years mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. and it's not knocked down because it's no longer sustainable. And then the council turn around and say, mm, yeah, but uh, we kind of like your windows. And yeah. because we kind of like your windows, uh, we're going to make you keep your windows. I had a case a couple of years ago uh, now that where the council fought tooth and nail for the retention of windows on a property that was two HMO flats, an HMO flat on the ground and basement of mm -hmm. ground floor, six bedroom, and an HMO flat on first and second mm -hmm. six bedroom. And as part of the development, we were saying, look, we want to improve this property, but there's no way 12 people in this building work. Yes. That's the existing solution. So let's do you a favor and we'll knock that down to eight for you and we'll take the flats out and make it one house again. And they fought tooth and nail over the windows and tooth and nail over the cladding and tooth and nail over the front wall you know, forcing the client to build the best front wall pretty much in the city. I mean, by far and away, the most original, using all original brickwork. Amazing. Mm. That's what he was forced to do in order to get everything else sorted out because mm. the conservation area took precedent over getting a better form of development mm. on that site. So it does, it is part of our system that's dragging. Yes. But I, I think this is also why, you know, um, within the mastermind, we need you and your team uh, because you know your way around um, these challenges. And I think someone like myself coming from a different background, uh, where, where do you start, you know? Um, and one thing is living in that property. Something very different is when you built it for someone else or refurbish it for someone else. Yeah, quite so. Quite so. I mean, you know, it's... Having someone like me in the mastermind, I think, is, is good for the mastermind simply because um, at least we're bringing that regulatory framework to bear. There are people who know the system just as well, if not better than I do. I'm just one of many. The, um, so the planning game, thank you for your backstory, because actually it's so important for people to know the backstory of other people. It's where you've come from. And it sounds like property is being bred into you. <laughs> yes. It's in your uh, it blood. Feels that way, yeah. <laughs> There's an element so, of something else than A, B or zero, whatever it might be. <laughs> A, P. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, blood it's type P. E, D. <laughs> <laughs> so it's your planning game. It's your, it's your podcast. It's your episode. So I know you've come, unlike some of my other sort of interviewees, guests, as it were, you've come bearing questions. So Joanna comes bearing teeth. Let's see how sharp those teeth are. See if I can answer them. Oh, I'm sure I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can. I, I, I haven't seen you not be able to answer a single question. <laughs> well, we'll questions. see. Um, uh, one of the, of the things I was looking at was um, council on properties or, or land, rather. Right. And um, there is land that I've been coming across regularly and bearing in mind I've been looking Greater London, so density is, yeah. is certainly a challenge, existing density of, of uh, buildings. Um, there are areas uh, which seem to have, let's say, unusual shapes and are quite widespread over, over um, quite a large surface, where it seems also from the point of view of existing buildings that it would make sense to maybe cut off a certain area. Yeah. Or on, from the different point of view, it does not make sense that the, the, there hasn't been anything built on it. Um, so what, uh, what are your thoughts on that? So... We do see this a lot in central London. It's because of how London developed. London developed from the original Roman city core, uh, which was destroyed in the Great Fire. Then we rebuilt and we rebuilt again and again and again, all the way to the urban expansion in the early 1800s in the building of the suburbs. So the land that you have left over in London is always going to be an awkward shape. It's always going to be odd. It's going to be at an angle or, or going to be something weird about it. But London is a progressive city. London is a city where 
you don't necessarily have to follow the strict rules of planning. You don't have to, you can break the rules or bend the rules if it achieves a different outcome. Um, to know how to play the game, you must first learn the rules. Mm -hmm. to, to know how to play the game well, you must learn where to break them. So the rules of planning in London are very, very different. We have the London plan as an overriding structure plan. We have that in precious few other areas across the country, but we have two tiers of planning in London. We've got the London plan and then we've got the borough plans. And we have different sensibilities in terms of density and space. There are certain things you can get away with in London that you would not be able to get away with elsewhere. You know, building right up to the wall of an underground line, for example, you would not get away with that in certain cities across the country. But in London, it's fair game. And it's only going to become more fair game. So what I would say is this. The government in its recent white paper has, and for those listening months and months and months ahead in time, we're just discovering the planning game. It's, it's April of 2020, and the government last month released a white paper talking about the importance of brownfield land, the importance of our urban land. So the government released this white paper that challenged councils to go further in terms of identifying land, whether in their ownership or not, for development. It went further still to ask for proposals for development over railway stations. So all of those railway lines that you've got running through London, it wanted to see development over the railway station. Now that's because in London, you have that repeatedly. Yes. Um, St Pancras station, for example, beautiful uh, uh, type of Italianate building. But it's a complete mishmash. You've got a hotel in there. You've got offices in there. You've got dwellings in there. You've got a complete... Uh, and even more so for some of the central London un underground stations. So it wanted to see this resource the country has brought back into use. Because up until now, network rail or transport for London has just turned around and said, no, you're not having my railway station or you're not having the air above it. Now the government said, no, we want your railway station. Now we're having it because we haven't got anything left. Now this is a particularly pertinent because we're at the time in the year and, and at the time at this political moment where central government has told the mayor of London that they may not publish their new London plan. And they may not publish the new London plan because they can't find enough housing for London. Yeah. And we're also at a point in time where some of some of the London boroughs are failing catastrophically. Um, City of London, as I spoke to Lloyd, for the people listening, it was Lloyd last week. For me and Joanna, it was like an hour ago. Um, but City of London has can only find 35 or thereabouts, 32 percent housing land supply which is ridiculous, it's a tiny amount. And because it's a tiny amount, they're now in trouble. They have to go and find housing for the square mile because they have a housing target. Um, Spellthorn, which is a borough in southwest London, just below Uxbridge and Hillingdon, so just south of Heathrow Airport, Again, an authority that can't find more than 60% of its housing delivery over the last three years in tremendous trouble. On the other side, Borough of Havering, which is Romford, can't find more than 60%. You know, we've got London authorities struggling massively. And that's where London becomes more progressive. And um, I'm really glad that you've mentioned the housing delivery test measurements um, because I've been looking at uh, the table uh, quite intently and um, 
picking out uh, who, who has the biggest challenge, which, which council or award, definitely City of London, as you mentioned, comes out on top, which is quite interesting, uh, mm -hmm. considering that the focus there has been always or traditionally more on office, providing office space and, yeah. and infrastructure around office workers more than, than living uh, space. Um, but I have been also looking at some of the other um, areas, um, mm -hmm. some of which you mentioned. and. Um, do you have any suggestions and recommendations um, how to approach councils, how to um, to partner up with them uh, in those areas? Um, so they will all have, they will all have heads of housing. Even now, in the middle of this epidemic, everyone is still functioning at the council. They'll just be working at home. So you'll be able to get hold of the heads of housing. You'll be able to get hold of the heads of reg regeneration. And for City of London, the head of planning right these are the key members of staff the decision makers at the top of the pyramid that are in the most trouble as far as their officers go because ultimately the buck stops with them if i was the head of planning at city of london i'd be looking at that statistic going shit and for people who listen to the podcast shit is a completely acceptable word um, I'll be looking at my statistics going, shit, uh, what have my officers been doing? Have they just been sitting on their asses? Um, why haven't we done anything? And you, you look at the surroundings, Tower Hamlets, building like crazy, mm -hmm. knocking them out. Yeah. Next door. City of London, literally next door. Mm -hmm. They were Greenwich on the south side. Mm. It's bugging. Killing it. Yes. City of London. Meh. Yeah so not so much so it's a case of um i would be going to these lead officers and saying right okay what land have you got and how can we help you if you need developers to come forward how do we help you do that mm. that's very helpful and um I, I guess it's a very different question but something that licks into good use of space um mm. There are currently great plots, um, very often uh, in between, hidden between uh, houses, estates, mm -hmm. which uh, where, where garages have been built in the past. Yeah. And uh, where garages belong to one single owner, um, mm -hmm. that's um, obviously a quite relatively straightforward game. However, recurrently I come across garages, there might be 10 in a row and every single one is owned by a different uh, owner. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so it's just almost do, like a version of land assembly then. It's, it's exactly that. It is a version of land assembly. You're mm -hmm. basically assembling options on each one of those garages. The, the, the greater risk in that is that it would only take one of the owners to say no to stop you because you need effectively all of them. The alternative is that you approach it from a point of view of airspace rather than the garages themselves right. you say to the owner i want to build you a new garage i'll build you a new garage be lovely it'll be brick built and you won't and you won't get asbestos poisoning every time you open the garage door because most of these have got asbestos roofs what i want is to do a deal with you where you hold the freehold of the garage and i get the flying freehold of whatever i decide to put above but you get the garage now, there are some absolutely cracking developments up and down the country that have done that and that have built above, they're called fogs, flats over garages, and that have built above um, garage plots and you retain the garage. Now, the benefit to you is that if your garage plot, as some of the stuff in London is, is in a flood risk zone, then you're building in for yourself two and a half meters worth of flood defense because your flat is two and a half meters mm -hmm. above the ground. Yes, you're not putting sleeping accommodation in the ground floor. Mm -hmm. You're putting mm -hmm. accommodation at first floor level and above. So, and we see this in the 1970s a lot. So there's a lot of estate building that went on in the 70s where you had flats above garage courts you see it a lot in, at southwark and tower, tower hamlets in particular mm -hmm. some of the older 1950s to 70s blocks are foes or fogs they're flats over access or flats over garages and that was the way they did it well i think 
the thing about architecture and the thing about planning is it works in cycles and it's like fashion yeah it will come back we're seeing a resurgence of certain certain fashion trends at the moment but this fashion of putting flats above something else will come back to us and it's a good way of resolving the well i can't get all of the owners on ground floor so what i'll do is i'll get them in a different way mm -hmm. i'll offer them a brand new asset Mm -hmm. that they don't have to pay for because what I'm getting is more valuable. What I'm getting is the air above. Which, uh, that's very interesting because I, I remember you talking about someone who, I think in Euston Road. Yes, uh, did exactly that. Mm -hmm. Just on a much grander scale than a few exactly. garages. It's, all it is is scales. And when, you, when you've dealt with it on a small scale, it gives you some confidence to then move to a different scale. So a different scale, for example, might be a car park mm -hmm. and that would be a flow a flat over access or flats over access mm -hmm. um and you would go to the council and say you have a car park yes we have a car park what i want to do is do a deal with the council i want to say to the council right you're probably going to lose about 30 spaces out of that car park but in return I want to build and get the rights to build uh, a development of, let's call it 50 homes above the car park. Now, if you want to see how grand this can go, Google and anyone at home, I challenge you to do this. Google Hudson Yards Development, New York City. Mm -hmm. All right. It's an amazing uh, episode of um extraordinary engineering on it and there's an amazing uh ted talk on it and there's a whole host of videos on it what they did there the hudson yards in america were a city block of railway freight yards mm -hmm. that could not be closed they were an integral part of new york's transit network yeah mm -hmm. they could not be closed you could not stop traffic what they did was build a city block over the top of them and kept the rail yards open. So trains running underneath all the time and workers building a whole city block, which in New York is 26 acres above the freight yards. Right. And they're building tower blocks on that city block right now. So I don't think we're imaginative enough with land that council owns. Mm -hmm. I think we have only scratched the surface in terms of proposing to councils different options for their own land because we're not touching these car parks. We're not touching this, these yards. We're not touching council service yards. So councils will have service yards where their bin lorries are stored, where their, um, where all of their, uh, maintenance guys keep all of their trucks. They will have service yards. We're not touching council buildings. And to give you an idea what I mean by that, Farron Borough Council, which is a borough down in the south, near to where I live, in order to find its five-year housing land supply, they allocated the civic offices as housing. Right. It's a 13-story right. tower block, right in the middle of town, and they allocated it for a housing site because that was all they had left. And to prove this point, they also allocated every single car park they own, every multi-story, everything. They just built a brand new 250 space car park to, on the south side of town in Fairham, and then they allocated it for 500 homes. That's in incredible. A, in basically a four-story building yeah. living above. So That's we have done this in the past. It's called podium development. We just don't do it very often because we think there is an easier option. But in London, there aren't any easy options. There are just solutions. And actually, this is yeah. an important solution.
Yes, it's, it's a very interesting thought also in terms of what I tend to look at. And um, sometimes I'm, I'm a bit jealous of when Lloyd um, runs his uh, sourcing sessions and, uh, and he finds lots of plots in five minutes. Uh, it, it never is in London. <laughs> and um, and uh, I'm, I'm slightly jealous of that. And then I'm thinking maybe I should focus on other areas of the UK, uh, then Greater London, and then I would have a similar experience. No, I think what you need to learn do is learn the language of London. Mm. So every, and this is kind of an important point, every council has its own rule book. So London is no different. Every council in London will have its own rule book and its own sensibilities. For those councils that are struggling to find their housing, their language is we need housing. Mm. Right? Mm. For the councils that aren't struggling to find their housing, they don't need you. They don't want you. You're effectively a terrorist. No. So... <laughs> They don't negotiate with terrorists. They definitely don't negotiate with planning consultant terrorists, but they don't need you. So why should they negotiate? Whereas if you go to a council that needs you and you're dealing with previously developed land and you're saying, right, I can actually make this work. I can perform a, ma a, ma a piece of magic trick here and I can put, build you a building and get you to keep the car park. Mm. I want you to keep the car park. It's yours. I don't want to touch it. Have it. It'll do me a favor because I've got a car park underneath my building that I can tell people to go and park in. Right? But you're building over the car park. Yes. So um, I, I think very much... I think I think building underground and uh, building car parks below buildings is probably not explored as much as it could be. Yeah. Um, and and again, from from an ecological point of view and for other reasons, there are there are challenges in London why it's not as straightforward as it might be somewhere else. However, uh, if you can't go up, uh, you have to go down. There's no and if you can't expand laterally, um, th there's the only other two options left. So. Um, uh, one way or another, if you need more more housing, you have to, as you were saying, explore more creative options. Yes, and it's those that are exploring those options that will win the game. So in London, for London developers, and we're coming to the end of the podcast now, and actually we're almost getting into the meat of it, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> in London, for London developers, well, but that's... You asked some big questions, so we're going to give some big answers. For London developers, there is no point in swimming with the tide. Right? There's no point in moving with the tide, the, the, the other developments that are going on. Because all you're going to be doing is competing in the same marketplace with people who can outbid you, who can outbuild you, who can win tomorrow. So you have to be more creative. You have to be more intelligent about what you do mm -hmm. and you have to look for development options that no one else is looking for so and i know because um joanna is part of the white box mentorship we're going to go through a bucket load of sites tomorrow because it's the planning clinic day um what i would challenge you to do or think about as, almost as a result of the podcast mm. is how can I be creative? So have a look at, for example, the council's asset register, not the brownfield register, the asset register. They must all maintain one and find out how many car parks they own. Let's just focus our attention on car parks. Pick one council, say, right, how many car parks does this council own? And then look at them. Mm -hmm. Can I build above them? Yeah. Are they in areas where I wouldn't want to build above them? they are and they're in a troubled authority an authority that can't find uh that isn't at a hundred percent is at less than a hundred percent then i would be writing to that authority and asking them what their intentions are for that piece of land and can you have a discussion about negotiating the right to build dwellings that the council needs above now you could even couch that in terms of i want to build affordable housing I want to build at your maximum affordable rate. So if it's 40%, I'm going to give you 40%. Mm -hmm. But I want the right to build. And I want the council as a JV partner. Mm -hmm. They're bringing the land. 
you're yes. just bringing the everything else mm -hmm. nothing to stop you doing that joanna that's just taking one development strategy mm -hmm. and expanding it from a point of i'm building over someone's garage to okay fine there's no garage there i'm building over a car park great and that this is really helpful as well because it, it links straight to um, how to um, use the housing delivery test uh, in, a, in a creative way, not just looking at the, the top um, councils, but actually combining it with that other information for a creative solution. That's exactly it. And in London, we have to be more creative. We have to be more intelligent. We have to use all of the tools in our armory to get the development land to work. But if we're able to do so, the reward is that much higher. Mm. Um, it is a tough market. And I congratulate you for even thinking about it. But it's a market you can win in if you just apply a creative process. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and I don't think these days there's anything that's easy. So I think it's just choosing the right, difficult, challenging for you. So... Um, I think for us it's property, for others it might be, I don't know, being an astronaut, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think it's this, is just, different way. this is just your Everest at the end of the day. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Cool. Joanna, it's been an absolute delight to have you on The Planning Game. I hope a lot of people have got a lot out of that. Um, I know we're going to be speaking tomorrow because we've got a clinic tomorrow, mm -hmm. but that's fine. Uh, if people want to get hold of you, if they want to talk to you about the amazing stuff that you're doing and what you're looking at, um, and just to touch base as fellow developers, like-minded people in London, how do they get hold of you? Uh, so, um, as, as you said, I'm part of the White Box Mastermind Group. Um, and uh, you can also reach me on my email, uh, which is uh, favoritespaces at outlook.com. Perfect. Thank you, for, Joanna, for joining me. Um, next time, I don't know who I've got next time, but it will be next time. Thank you for joining us on The Planning Game, and I'll see you Thank very, you very, very soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me.